with us for this important conversation, calling out xenophobia, racism, and intolerance during the COVID-19 crisis. And while we know that racism and bigotry is nothing new, particularly as it intersects with higher education, we should all be concerned about the levels of bias and intolerance even as our institutions have shifted learning and operations from bricks and mortar campuses to virtual learning in the wake of COVID-19. Today, we have some of the nation's best thinkers to weigh in on this issue as we offer to you best practices and ways to advance equity and inclusion during these difficult and trying days. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Charles Davis of the University of Southern California, who will begin a tenure track faculty position at the University of Michigan this fall. Congratulations, Dr. Davis. We also have Dr. Leandra Paris of William & Mary and Dr. Vanessa Sansone of the University of Texas at San Antonio. Before we get started, I wanted to encourage you to submit your questions. We will have some time for Q&A uh, and we'll get to as many as possible. And I wanna invite you to tweet about the session, tagging in diverse issues and using the hashtag COVID-19 racism. We're also planning to live stream this discussion uh, on our Facebook page, Diverse Issues. Finally, we recognize that in an hour, we cannot simply cover everything. So I've asked our panelists to provide me some recommendations for additional readings related to this topic, and we will post their suggestions to our website and see if we can send them out to all attendees at a later date. So welcome. I want to start with Dr. Sansone and then uh, go to Dr. Davis and um, then Dr. Paris with asking you to help us to assess the climate level in the field of higher education in the wake of COVID-19. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Um, thank you to Diverse um, for having us as well as um, my fellow panelists for engaging in such a thoughtful discussion that there definitely is a need right now. I think when we think about the field of higher education in the wake of COVID-19, what really comes to mind is deciding about these organizational shifts that are going to happen because the, the climate is one of instability. It's unstable right now. And I think even for professors um, and students, as well as staff, we've seen from day to day that you know from one day to the next things were changing and still are in some cases and so this idea of, of creating stability um, will also begin to help us think about how organizations being it can shift in terms of supporting equity access and diversity um, one of the most important things that i find interesting in the wake of covid 19 is how organizationals are actually going to do that what is the intentionality that they're going to have behind these shifts so shifts online, shifts uh, that were necessary for the health and well-being of faculty, staff, and students. But how are we going to make sure that um, we remain equitable in, in terms of access um, and diversity? Because not only do we see um, how some of these uh, shifts are promoting um, equity, like I can think about some of the financial aid uh, issues that have begun to shift where we're supporting students more in the wake of this epidemic. But I think we also need to think about the ways that, that we're also uh, creating unintentional ways of uh, inequity in these shifts. But it's really promising to see how organizations are doing this. I think um, what, what leaves me with is that it can be done. Uh, which we've hear so many times that organizations, you know, this is the way that it's always been done. This is how higher education functions. But clearly this epidemic is pushing us to think more broadly and think more in terms of equity and success, not only for students, but staff and faculty. Thank you. And we certainly want to get to some of those inequities a little later in our conversation, but I appreciate that. Dr. Davis. Uh, so I think those are all excellent points by my colleague. Um, I think one of the things that I'm turning my attention to uh, is this notion of the external environment and sort of the context within which our college and universities are situated. And one thing that we know for sure, uh, even emblematic from the uh, election of Donald Trump, is how much the external environment can actually uh, drive what's happening in the larger sort of context of how we understand campus climate. And so, you know, really the genesis of even um, this webinar today is as a result of what we've seen in terms of anti-Asian sentiment specifically uh, as it relates to the um, 
thinking about the virus uh, in and of itself. You know, Donald Trump has repeatedly mentioned it and called it a Chinese virus. We've seen a number of violent attacks happen uh, across the United States, especially in those areas that are highly populated by uh, Southeast Asian folks in particular. Um, and so for me, I'm thinking about this sort of like broader sense of climate and an externality sense of what that means, not just now, but also when folks come back to campus, mm -hmm. the extent to which xenophobia will uh, find itself again, very much prominent and pressing uh, for those particular students and the ways that human interaction has been deeply affected by something like this pandemic. And so what does it mean for the types of ostrac ostracization that may take place, um, how we might view and, and think about our uh, Asian American resource centers and things of that nature. Um, and so I think there's something to be said for not underestimating how the environment within which our colleges and universities are situated may have a really deep and lasting impact based on anti-Asian xenophobia. Mm, yeah, I appreciate that. Yes, Dr. Parrish. Yeah, so I saw something today that I think captures this where it's like you're not working from home, you're at home because of a pandemic and a crisis trying to work. And so I think that as has already been pointed out, that creates a lot of instability, a lot of stress, a lot of feeling like we don't have control. And we know that when that happens, people start to get hostile and aggressive. And so it sort of increases the risk that racism and xenophobia is going to leer its head in these virtual online formats because we're all scrambling and I think at least my concern is what are we missing in that scramble and how do we respond to that effectively and I think as Dr. Davis pointed out when we come back there's a new normal that we're going to have to establish and how do we make sure that we don't lose equity and we don't lose what we do here when we come back and establish this new environment that we're going to have to function in. And that's not going to be easy to do. How, how do we disrupt these the, the sort of racism that we know that is out there and existing. And Dr. Davis, you mentioned uh, the racism, particularly against Asian, um, Asian and Asian Americans. How, how do we, what are some specific examples that we can give to um, those who are here about how to disrupt that kind of racism? Sure. Uh, I mean, I think one sort of simple thing is to uh, acknowledge the extent to which we ourselves may not be directly a member of that particular community, but how important it is for us to intervene in situations in which we see those that are vulnerable and more vulnerable, perhaps, uh, than others, and stand in that gap, right? We need to be able to take up space and put ourselves, maybe sometimes even our very bodies, between uh, those that wish to do harm and those that are experiencing harm. And so I think it's really important that we not just think of what it means to be sort of an ally in this particular moment, but also accomplices and mm -hmm. dismantling the ways that interpersonal uh, racism takes place. Uh, you know, when we think about the racism that happens in classrooms, even in the extent to which professors are either participatory or even complicit with uh, comments that are made during lectures. Um, we've seen, you know, to some extent, the, the effects of Zoom bombing that have happened as well. Um, I think all of those are opportunities for folks who are not a part of that specific community to step up and intervene um, and create some space between, the, again, the harm doers and the harm receivers. Um, and I think that that's just really important, right? When we think about the broader uh, umbrella under which uh, white supremacy operates, that all of us are sort of fighting against the same very thing, right? And so this is a moment for us to strengthen our solidarity within and across racial groups. Um, and so I think it's just really important that we don't uh, leave Asian American uh, members of our communities to have to fend for and deal with this by themselves. I think about that acutely at a place like USC and within California uh, with our institutions when we know sort of the demographics with which um, Asian Americans are a very prominent part of that, right? And so I think that this is an opportunity for us to force together even stronger as a community uh, to fight the rising tide of white supremacy on campus. Thank you. Dr. Sansong. No, I think Dr. Davis brings up an excellent point. Like I can think about uh, using the the Zoom bombings as an opportunity to talk about uh, these topics that typically we don't like to talk about. And it doesn't matter what uh, field you're in, even if you're a professor of biology, professor of English, you know, it, it's not, um, it should not be the uh, call for one particular type of uh, subject, you know, to take on the task of discussing racism, xenophobia, um, it should be across institutions, across uh, disciplines. And so really taking the time and opportunity to uh, give students space to talk about how they feel is going to be key, I think, in, in the way that we should move forward, not only in terms of the online platform, but even when we go back into the classroom. I think this is really setting a tone for um, what institutions should be focusing on for the greater good of our population. Mm -hmm. Dr. Paris? Yeah, so when I think about disrupting, at least as what we're doing right now in terms of the virtual world, I kind of think of like four different areas. So one is 
kind of recognizing your own bias, like you can't respond effectively if you don't recognize it. And I think aggression can be something blatant like racist comments, but it can also be microaggressions that can be just as disruptive to the learning process and to people's mental well-being. And so really making sure that you understand the context in which you're working and that you can recognize some of those more subtle forms like exclusion and cyberbullying. And then also being preventive and having those policies, you know, um, one of the things that I did was I said, I recognize that Asian individuals are being targeted by racial and xenophobic remarks, and I want to make it clear that's not acceptable in my classroom. And if that happens, you know, this is going to happen. And it's gonna, I basically said you'll be dismissed, but, you know, insert whatever discipline that you think is appropriate. And then that way, when it does happen, I have something to fall back on. And I think making sure that we create that climate, like Dr. Sanson said, that we can really build from and create that collaboration within the school environment, within our virtual classrooms. And I think responding consistently and making sure that every single time it happens, we respond the same way. I think we often focus on the power of the aggressor, not recognizing the power of everybody else who sees it. And so modeling that so other students are empowered to react is gonna be really important. The, the transition from uh, bricks and mortar kind of campus to, to online happened so quickly. And in many ways, I think a lot of faculty members did not necessarily prepare for the levels of bigotry and discriminatory kind of comments and remarks that were going to be made online. What, what are some guidelines or ground rules um, now that we're in this new culture and this new environment that faculty have to kind of initiate in order to ensure that all folks remain safe and comfortable, even if it's in the online virtual classroom. Yeah, I think what, you know, Dr. Paris kind of set the tone for, um, you know, part of these discussions, but it's really, you know, the faculty themselves modeling uh, this behavior, um, setting up your uh, syllabi to address some of these concerns um, in case you think um, there might be pushback from students about what the expectations, what, you know, even on an online platform, this is what will and will not be tolerated. Um, your syllabus can be one of those platforms for you to, to put uh, within Word to refer back to uh, when students do uh, want to push back and say, you know, I don't want to talk about race or any of these, you know, issues that make me feel uncomfortable. Well, you know, it's, it's a part of the modeling that you're going to do in your classroom. I really think too, and I have to, you know, bring, bring this forward. This is going to be of utmost importance, uh, particularly with regard to my white faculty colleagues for them to do this. Like the modeling behavior is going to be of key because again, so much of this is expected from uh, scholars of color and faculty of color, but it can't just be us. Um, demographically, there were, we represent so few in the academy. And so we need white allies to help us with um, pushing this forward, particularly in the classrooms. And this also includes white administrators too, because it does, you know, it has to be across institutional spaces, all spaces. Again, that's my point of like, it can't just be from, you know, the, the liberal and fine arts or humanities area. It has to be across all spaces. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Davis? Yeah, I mean, there's, um you know, so many things about this that, that we could discuss. Um, I want to just briefly shout out my former colleagues at the USC Race and Equity Center, uh, namely Dr. Simon Pendiger and Jade Agua, who had an amazing webinar that talked about sort of what needs to be done on the front end as well as the back end. And so one of the things that we commonly talk about uh, is this notion of building a container for the conversation that needs to happen in, in classrooms, right? Often these conversations sometimes happen by uh, sort of happenstance and we're not prepared right, the container uh, itself actually isn't big enough to hold all of the things that are going on. And so part of what this may look like in an online forum is really setting up parameters for engagement um, in ways that can demonstrate a, a certain level of modeling and success, really thinking about the features that Zoom now has available for it to create more secure environments, right? And so there's a lot of these uh, smaller things like just making sure that it's password protected, um, having a co-host that can help monitor some of the discourse and chat that's happening, uh, be, even remove participants if necessary, uh, taking off shared screen features, some of the infrastructure things that could happen in a virtual setting that would limit the possibility of this uh, taking place. Uh, and then of course, it's you know sort of what, what do you do in the moment? Right, and I think that's where we're finding that the gaps for faculty preparation to deal with racist incidents in the classrooms are very, very high. Um, and so I think uh, uh, more importantly, as um, 
Dr. Sinsone mentioned, the faculty who don't deal with this every day in their course topics, right, they don't teach about these areas, um, we really need to find ways to uh, engage and support them. And they have to be willing to engage with us to know that although you may be an expert in your particular area, that this is an area that is developing for a lot of folks that need to uh, really increase their expertise, their practical skill sets, to know how to create uh, interventions. And so even so much as, you know, having a conversation with your class, that if we are intercepted for some reason, here are the protocol that we're gonna to take to ensure that we can minimize the harm that takes place. And then here's a process and procedure that we will do to hopefully repair and restore uh, folks who have been harmed as a result of that process once we've addressed that issue. Um, and again, that's a skill set, and we want to think about that from a competency and proficiency lens. And so it should encourage institutions to think about using their Centers for Excellence in Teaching and Learning uh, really to, to strengthen those skill sets and those competencies for folks who otherwise do not teach and are familiar with this area. So, so institutions have to be proactive, really, um, and start now um, to really start preparing, because we don't know how long this will indeed last. And even if it doesn't last very long, it's still good best practices, right? Just good information Absolutely. to have in order to- it can't, And it can't just be the technical dimensions of how to use Zoom, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of like the same as the technical dimensions of teaching about how do I put a lecture together? Mm -hmm. um, it's like, okay, well, we can learn that, but you know, as Mike Tyson used to say, everybody's got a game plan until they get punched in the mouth. And that's what's happening in these Zoom bombing situations, right? We don't know how to be adaptable and to react when things happen because we don't have that deep sort of skill set and knowledge uh, that we need so that people can be effective teachers in online platforms as well as in the classroom. Right, right. And there are a lot of national resources that exist, as you point out, um, at, at USC and other places that can help institutions navigate this space. And that's important. Dr. Parrish. No, I agree. I love Dr. Davis's point about the containment and sort of like how to put that in there. And then also one of the things I've tried to do is similar, having someone who can monitor some of the discourse in the breakout rooms with Zoom so that it's not, you know, just me trying to monitor everybody. And I think it's okay to say I reserve the right to mute you. I reserve the right to remove. If you violate the policy of my class, I, you are out of this discussion and you lose those points. Um, and I think that just reminding at the beginning of every Zoom class of all of the policies that you have, not all of them, but you know, the ones that you really wanna make sure are being used in that moment. But the biggest thing for me is avoiding power struggles. And I think that that's, a sh you know, when someone's sort of talking and there's the, the lag in the Zoom and like you're trying to talk over them. And I think that's where those more assertive and active strategies will be important in terms of muting and removing them from the environment so that other students aren't continually having to be exposed to this. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk, if we can, about the intersection between, I think, race and class, because um, I think often when we talk about race, there is this connection to, to class, and we, we ought to address that as well. And so since this whole pandemic started, I think it clearly, um, you know, underprivileged um, students have been, in many ways, I think, left out of the conversation, or they, it's been, they've been mentioned in a secondary kind of way. Um, and, and Dr. Sisson, I know your work particularly um, focused on uh, rural students um, has, is, is really important. I was wondering if you could talk about the connection and link between the race and class piece. Yeah, I think a lot of times um, it's usually, you know, class typically gets to use as a way to um, overlook race and racism in the US, um, particularly when we think about poor white students. You know, we, we typically want to say like, well, how is that any different um, you know, um, a poor uh, Latinx student uh, from a poor white student or uh, a student from a rural area from an urban area. And, and so there's a lot of um, putting students in boxes. You know, and we like to put them in boxes and say like, we're just this identity or that identity. But in re reality, um, we're all multiple things. And so when we talk about this way of looking at the interplay of race and class, you began to see how systems and structures um, will really facilitate more in equity and in many cases oppression uh, for a lot of our students. So in particular, my work in rural areas, it's, it's been very interesting because I do look at students of color from rural areas um, in the field of higher education. And what's been most interesting is to see how, as Dr. Davis pointed out, these ways of like where we didn't think about um, you know, these students beforehand, but we're really not thinking about them even as we get punched in the face and start to make these abrupt shifts to just, you know, stay as stable as we can in higher education. So specifically with the move to online, we've seen a lot of discussion on the K through 12 front with how digital inequity um, is really demonstrating its and rearing its ugly head with regard to 
um, you know, students living in these spaces, but we can't forget how this also is playing out for students in higher education. Um, I, you know, the thing about rural areas is a really good representation, though, of urban spaces too. Um, I, you know, when the when the whole uh, epidemic started kind of coming down and the shift started happening, I was actually in Brooklyn, um, and the Wi-Fi access in in the brownstones that I was staying in was was shutting off and shutting on. And so, as a faculty member, I was being asked to facilitate online, um, you know, classrooms, and I didn't have access to broadband. And so these were the things that I was thinking about. It's like, see, here we go. Like, I, I don't even know what to do. Um, and this, you know, I'm a faculty member. I can only imagine the stress that my students were feeling when they were being told to shift to online and, um, you know, issues about their health and all these other concerns that were just layering on. So it's been very interesting to see how inequity has been perpetuated by these shifts. Um, and I think that's where my work will kind of demonstrate and hold a mirror to institutions to begin to think, well, don't forget about this, or there's an un unintended consequence of X. Um, because hopefully when we do move back, we can still, um, you know, have some good come from some of this with, like I mentioned in the beginning, with shifts in the policies with financial aid and things of that sort. Um, but there are places where class and race um, were missing some of these uh, discussions and points where we do need to address. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Davis? Yeah, I mean, I, I think those are all um, excellent, important points. Um, you know, I think a lot about the sort of presumption of ubiquity as it relates to internet access um, and this notion that, you know, we're just all digitally connected, especially this generation of uh, college student. And that's just, you know, not the case in a lot of rural areas that don't have access to high speed internet. And even for those of us that have the stressors that are put on now that everyone is at home in a crisis working. Um, you know, that that's also putting pressure on the uh, internet's ability to, to meet sort of the demand of what everybody needs to have at this time. Um, but I think in terms of, you know, the sort of the, the race class, uh, you know, dynamic, um, there's so many different aspects of this, right? And, and we're seeing not just in terms of the case of infections, but also in the case of deaths, how significant that's happening for particular communities. Um, and when we think about who is constituted as an essential worker, right? Where are those families and sort of what is the class ranking of those uh, individuals where if I'm a college student and maybe I'm the first person in my family to go to college and the oldest of, you know, multiple uh, kids, we know that uh, folks of color and black folks in particular live in multi-generational households. If I come home from school, what is the perception or expectation for me to contribute in a different way as a family member that intercedes my ability to engage in sort of, you know, what the school or the college provides, which is a space away from that, right? Mm -hmm. um, if my mother and I'm in a single parent household is an essential worker and she has to go to work and somebody needs to take care of the siblings because there is no daycare, right? How do we think about these different things? Um, and, and, you know, and I think one thing that's sort of popped up, I've been on some listservs and perhaps my colleagues have as well, um, about what is the appropriate like Zoom etiquette for students. And, you know, a lot of folks have said, oh, well, all of my students aren't using their video, not necessarily thinking that maybe there's something in the background that I don't want to be publicly available to everyone, right? Mm -hmm. At a place like USC, when we think about the uh, sort of class dynamics here, right? If I'm a first generation low income college student, I don't live in Beverly Hills, perhaps, or some other part of the country where, you know, I have the internet access, I have a background that's sort of appropriate that doesn't reveal my class situation when I'm trying to navigate the class politics of my institution. Um, and I think these are all things that we have to be much more aware of and how we think about instruction, how we think about our participation and engagement, or thinking about the implications for grading. Um, these are all things that are really, really important and really challenge us to question the value of meritocracy in a different kind of way, but a really important way, right? And we have to say to ourselves as institutions, as faculty, as education leaders, to what extent are we willing to be continuously invested in these you know, systems that overly stratify our society, stratify our student body, and ultimately may not matter when it comes to putting people above things like productivity over profit and of prestige. And there's also the assumption, of course, that the students have phones or computers uh, with cameras, right? And, and that exactly. they're able to even access um, the classroom platform. So, you know, often that's just the assumption, that's the given, but that's not always accurate, of course. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Dr. Austin, if I yes. can, if I yeah, can add one more thing from when Dr. Davis, you know, I think, I think it's, it's, you know, has to be said that um, the inequities in terms of the community at large U.S. have always been, um, you know, it's been much harder for communities of color. Um, and taking a step back from, you know, higher education, um, access to healthcare, access to um, just 
a good uh, K through 12 education. These are the things that are affecting communities of color um, already harder um, prior to mm -hmm. this epidemic. So it's just another thing um, that they're going to have to think about. Anybody who's from a community of color, a marginalized, historically marginalized community. So another thing for us to navigate, another thing for us to think about um, in terms of how we're reproducing inequity, um, that's the opportunity that I'm really hoping higher education will see and begin to um, create new incentives and policies to, to address because it can't just be higher education sitting on top of the hill. Um, you're going to have to start looking at other components um, as an entire organism um, within the community and the structure, especially if your students are coming from these places, which they are. Yeah, so I'm hearing that a rich engagement with the community becomes really important. Um, and, and really necessary um, in order to move forward. Dr. Paris, did you want to add in? No, I think those are all great points. I think a lot of the work that I've seen around like trauma and intergenerational, uh, intergenerational trauma and historical trauma, now we're adding on another trauma on top of that. And so I think managing, helping students manage some of that by providing resources that are available for them to access at will. I have a page that's like, here's all of the groups here on campus that you can meet with that, um, and reach out for help. And one of the things I keep thinking about in just listening to everything that's been said is this actually sets up one of the reasons I have a, a really big problem with synchronous meetings mm -hmm. because we are then requiring students to meet at a certain time um, and requiring them to be available for a certain amount of time when that is not always logistical. So Dr. Davis brought up childcare. That's when they're supposed to be helping watching their siblings and they're being you know, punished for not being able to be at these synchronous events. And so I really would urge people to think about how you're requiring them to show up for these um, just classroom synchronous events. And then also how can you provide other opportunities that they can take at their own pace, say when they can get away or when the internet's not as crowded, you know, depending on where they are and they have better bandwidth. And so um, I think that's the only thing that I would add is just how we're, be careful about overuse of synchronous time. No, that's a good point. One of the things I'm hearing a lot um, from faculty is um, that on college campuses, there is often this effort to push administrators to keep diversity, equity, and inclusion issues at the forefront. Um, and that's always a constant battle, as we know. But the concern is that as the institutions move virtually, that uh, some of the gains, some of the progress that has been made will not continue. And uh, it'll almost be as if you know, once we return back to our institutions, we're starting from ground zero again. Is that of any concern to any of you? Uh, I mean, it's deeply concerning for me when I think about the sort of budgetary implications for diversity, equity, and inclusion work, right? Um, one of the things that we know is that often those pools of money are contingent, um, they're uh, discretionary, and so they can be repurposed as institutions see fit. And I think we're going to see a shift to some extent of monies that would otherwise be directed for DEI efforts to be things that are quote unquote pivoted to, you know, COVID-19 responses without thinking about the diversity, equity, and inclusion implications of that particular moment. And so I think institutions have to be more thoughtful and even perhaps creative to really pivot the notion of DEI within the context of a pandemic, right? This is for many folks who are working in higher education, the first time they've ever had to deal with something of this magnitude. Um, and so I think it's important as we think about equity mindedness as a frame as Sullivan Simone's work points out of what does it mean to apply that framework within this particular moment. Um, you know, as uh, Dr. Paris was talking about the role of like historical and intergenerational trauma, I'm thinking in particular maybe about our native and indigenous students. We have, uh, you know, articles that have recently been reported that for Navajo Nation in particular, that their rates per capita are exceeding those of New York City. So what does it mean to have to respond to those particular needs of those students if and when they return to campus uh, in places like Arizona, um, California, New Mexico, et cetera? Um, and if you don't have that DEI frame in mind, then you think that this just applies to all students, right? And of course, all students have been affected to some extent. And we know that coronavirus doesn't discriminate, but we do know that policies and practices in higher education do. So what does it mean to then take that approach, take that lens, and think about if we're going to have a response from uh, you know, a pandemic standpoint, how do we ensure that diversity, equity, and inclusion aren't lost or you know, pushed to the margins as they often have been when something else recenters? Yeah, I'm also wondering, and I'll get to, the, to you all on the question as well, about some of our academic programs, um, more specifically ethnic studies, African-American mm. studies, women's studies, that are always operate on the margins anyway. Um, whether or not some of those programs may in fact be cut down the road. Um, so I'm wondering if that is also a concern. 
That's yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Paris. Um, that's actually my thought was, I can think just at least at my institution, there are these programs that have been developed by key faculty who may or may not be able to come back just because they're visiting professors and now we have a hiring freeze. And so there are entire initiatives that were just starting to get off the ground that now aren't gonna have that leadership and administration are going, at least in my experience, whenever there's anything else to prioritize, diversity and equity is the thing that gets cut. And so how do we, you know, particularly as a white ally, how do we make sure that conversation keeps getting brought back up and we don't let that happen and how do we advocate for those groups that are now don't leave student groups who don't have funding or aren't allowed to do their travel or scholarships and fellowships that were specific to students of color who now aren't going to have any buyouts. So now I can't give you a stipend um, when you join my program. And so I think these are all things that administrators would say, oh, well, there's all these other things that are more important, but that's the structure of student well-being and that we're su providing successful opportunities and equitable educational opportunities. And so for me, I think it's just every time I have these meetings, I bring it back to how are we being equitable? How are we making sure everyone has access? And how are we gonna set it up so that those who are affected the most get what they need once they get here? And so I think that that's, I feel that struggle because my hands are tied in some ways, but then making sure it is never missed out of the narrative. Yeah, yeah, very good points, Dr. Sensel. No, I, I think um, it's just helpful to remind institutions and the thoughts for um, these contingency plans and these cuts that um, as Dr. Paris pointed out, you know, students are, um, are watching, right? Communities are watching, uh, stakeholders are watching to see how institutions will react to this. And if we begin to see um, cuts to um, issues that affect students of color, you know, uh, women's studies, uh, racial and ethnic studies programs, that does speak volumes to where the priorities lie, particularly in the wake of COVID-19. And so those institutions that do respond in equitable ways, they probably actually, they, they will because students are hurting right now and they wanna know that they're gonna go to institutions that care about them holistically. Because again, and you know, I have a demography background, so that's why I tend to bring up demographics. Um, demographics are dictating, you know, who those institutions are that we can, um, will we'll begin to enroll. Um, and again, it's going to be students from um, these that have always been at the margins, um, but that have these intersecting um, identities. Um, an example that I'll, I'll provide, um, but you know, our dreamer students, right? Mm -hmm. These students who um, are being left out of the conversation uh, from the federal government, um, institutions are not really sure how to respond. And honestly, they're probably hoping that they just go away. But these are students that matter, the, you know, and these are the populations that, um, that demographically, they're gonna be the ones who, if you wanna keep your enrollment up, and have students fill seats, these are the populations that you're going to have to consider and be creative and intentional and thoughtful about in terms of how you respond. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I have, I have two more questions and then I want to go to uh, Q&A with the audience. The, the next question is, what are some of the ways individuals can help to create community online for marginalized students? So I mentioned Harry. earlier, um, one of the things that I've tried to offer is that, you know, as a white faculty member, I'm not always the one that they may be most comfortable reaching out to. And I let them know on the onset that, that I, that's fine. And these are some other areas. And so we have on campus students of color, graduate student of color, of color um, organizations that are very active right now. They have Zoom meetings. I make sure that those links are available. Anything that our national organization is sharing in terms of mentorship and availability for those communities to meet, I'm just putting out on the sub page of my online course so that it's always available and accessible. Um, and I think that just having the conversations before you have to, so preventively making sure that it's part of the discourse of your course and making sure that you're tying it into the content. I'm very lucky that I'm teaching crisis intervention right now. So this is very easy for me to tie in, but I think any way that you can sort of acknowledge the current state of what's going on will help build community because you're just acknowledging the space that we're all in right now. Um, and so I think that's you know providing those resources and letting them know where they can get things beyond just you. Mm. Dr. Sensel? So one of the things that I have, have tried to do in terms of creating community is again, um, tying into the lecture, the, um, you know, what's going on um, into the curriculum. Um, 
But again, it's giving uh, students space, as Dr. Paris said, to talk about it, but also understand that we're all in it too. I think sometimes, uh, particularly when we think about hierarchies of power, that faculty are, you know, are invincible to all this, and that's not necessarily the case. I'm struggling just as much as my students are struggling with the day-to-day -day aspects and the change and, you know, all the stressors and pullers, you know, that, that are taking me different ways. Um, I, I, if I'm going through that, I know my students are going through that. And I think there's solidarity that can happen there. And when you begin to, um, you know, address those things and bring those things forward, I think you create a community um, and a foundation, a solid foundation to move forward because you build trust there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's opportunities that I've created to bring in conversations of what's going on in the current um, pandemic era. Um, and you can pull from any place. So again, I want to make sure that, that it's not discipline specific. It can be anything um, to create these opportunities for students to build trustful relationships that will um, create community. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Davis. Yeah, I really just want to underscore, um, I think, the points that have been made, um, and particularly Dr. Sinson's point of, you know, the extent to which faculty can share a space of vulnerability. Um, I think that's really, really important to both humanize sort of who we are in this space, but to really, you know, do what we would say is being in right relationship with the process of teaching and learning. Uh, they, we often ask so much of our students to give of themselves and to share their stories, but how often are we willing to share with them sort of the ways in which we are struggling uh, in and of ourselves? Um, and at least in my experience, that's been really, really useful to actually achieving some of the learning outcomes that are, you know, associated with the course traditionally, simply by having a better relationship with those students. And so, you know, in my particular case, um, you know, this is something that I open up every class session with uh, sort of an undefined amount of time where we can discuss what's been happening in the world generally and, you know, particularly what's going on with COVID-19 and even my own struggles of having to navigate that um, as somebody, you know, uh, partnered and with, uh, you know, a new child that's just come into the world and my own concerns about, you know, the uh, immunocompromisation of, of infants at this point um, and having be, to be the person that goes out every couple of weeks to get food and supplies that we may need and my own concerns of just not knowing whether I could pick up something, possibly bring it back to my partner and to our child. Um, and, you know, that for me was something I felt like I needed to share in part because one, my students have been excellent in supporting me through uh, sort of this process while sort of partially being on leave and teaching, but letting them know that they're not going through this alone. And, you know, lo and behold, many of them are experiencing these things with relatives or with in-laws or with other people. Um, and I think knowing that we can recognize the humanity in each other, um, I think is sort of the first point of us being able to, to do our work effectively in any type of way at this particular moment, uh, because we have to go right where we don't think we want to, right? This is a barrier to entry, whether we address it or not. And so I think it behooves us to sort of get in there, get dirty, um, and, and do the work of just being in right relationship with one another so that we can move forward together as a collective. No, I think that's a good point. I, I'm thinking about the news that over the last couple of weeks of colleges and universities deciding um, to stop the tenure track clock um, uh, or, to, you know, to allow individuals to have a little bit more time, obviously, given this whole situation. And I'm curious, and you all are um, assistant professors, and I'm wondering, is there discussion among colleagues about what that means? Um, is there also an expectation that you will continue to do the scholarly work that you did um, prior to this all happening? I mean, how has this kind of reshaped and changed the ways in which you approach your scholarly work? I'm just curious. I think um, a lot of institutions um, have decided on that. Some of them have not. Um, so again, it's not standard across the board for institutions what they've, they've, they've decided. Um, I can tell you my own institution, that's not something that um, they're standardizing for everybody. Whereas other institutions, they're, they've done it for all tenure track faculty. Um, that doesn't mean that they're not, um, they wouldn't consider that for us, but you know, again, uh, different approaches that every institution is taking. So it's kind of hard to talk about this um, in a generalized kind of way, because again, what, what's happening in my institution may differ from what's happening at Dr. Davis's, Dr. Paris's, but as a tenure track faculty, um, my biggest uh, concern is going to be my emotional uh, health and well-being. And so the idea of productivity right now, um, I think, you know, we, we've all been socialized into the academy to, to be productive and to be these workhorses. But it's really the COVID-19, I think, is really giving us pause to consider 
what is and is of utmost importance. Um, what does that mean in terms of our tenure status? I'm really hoping that administration um, begins to be empathetic to those situations um, and begin to shift their ideas of what productivity is. Um, to, to be quite honest, in terms of the coins of the academy where journals and manuscript submissions are usually top, um, there's already concerns from journals about the uptick in submissions and uh, the, the downtick of reviewers. And so, you know, what do you do even if you are productive and constantly submitting? They're still going to be in queue and yet the clock still keeps ticking. So those are things that I think um, what, as tenure track faculty, um, I really need to rely on my senior scholars who are tenure and who are uh, members in the field um, to include organizations like AAUW, you know, the American Association for, um, I'm sorry, American Association for University Professors, AAP, um, those organizations to really begin to um, fight for us who are untenured or at least advocate for us in ways because there is a power dynamic and a shift that I only have so much power in in addressing. Yeah, yeah I would agree. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that our university is doing is we're actually getting feedback from faculty. Like, how do you want this to go? Do you want a choice? Do you just want us to not, maybe we don't count student evaluations because we expect that they're going to go down with everything. And they haven't actually come out and said exactly what they're going to do. But I think the idea of letting people decide, do I stop my clock? And do I not? My concern is if I, you know, if you do stop your clock, what if you have pre-tenure funds that are associated with that? Does it go away? Do you lose it? And I have colleagues right now that are scrambling to spend the remainder of their pre-tenure funds because that was, you know, allocated for research. But if you're doing K through 12 research and you're in the schools, you don't have participants anymore. And so how are, you know, institutions kind of earmarking funds for pre-tenure faculty that don't have anywhere to spend it right now, but supposedly need to finish it by July? So I think that that's the things that we're kind of seeing is just people how to navigate those systematic structures that already put us lower on the power structure. And I think your point about senior faculty really advocating for you is important. They're the ones on the evaluation committee. They're the ones who are voting on these policies about what's included and what's not. And I'll just say, you know, shout out to my colleagues at William & Mary. We had a social hour and they said, I'm here for you. We're going to advocate for you. And I think that is probably one of the greatest things that I've had since this whole thing started. So I do think it's on our mind, but we're also trying to put out our own fires. You know, like you said, mental well-being is, is going to be coming first. Dr. Davis, did you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I come at it from a, you know, sort of unique position. I'm at, you know, I've spent the last six years in non-tenure track roles. I'll start my first year on the tenure track in the fall. Um, and so I'm actually thinking about what it means for those that are starting and will soon be in the tenure stream for how we even think about productivity moving forward, right? This notion that we return to some sense of normalcy um, I think is a, is a bit overstated and we don't know what the new normal is going to be. And so what does that mean for the way that we evaluate promotion and tenure cases where everyone is quote unquote less productive? Do we shift our model from, you know, one of quantity to one of quality um, and in terms of a better balance? I mean, many of us know scholars of color in particular who have gotten tenure with, you know, twice, three times the amount of publications as their white counterparts. And so that has sometimes become the new standard by which we are all judged. And is that even reasonable moving forward given the infrastructure challenges and also the mental health and emotional health needs uh, folks trying to focus, you know, and refocus their efforts on relationships with people in their proximity. Um, and so I'm thinking about that a lot of what it means for new tenure track faculty coming into the fall. And I'm also thinking about, you know, the many PhD students who are concerned about the job market, which has always been sort of precarious, but for a place that's already been really difficult for folks to get into, myself included, you know, what does it mean for how few or fewer tenure track positions there will be in the fall um, and following falls after that for students, uh, despite their productivity, despite all of the things that they've been able to do to put themselves in positions to win, will there be opportunities? And, and that we don't know as many institutions are having to, you know, tighten uh, their, you know, finances a bit. And even some places have uh, withdrawn when rescinded offers. Some people have just frozen hiring. In particular, we talked about the implications for uh, ethnic studies. I think at Harvard, there is an entire department that just isn't probably going to happen anymore as a result. And this is, you know, Harvard, biggest endowment in the world. So um, I think there are a lot of questions that still need to be answered. Uh, but I don't know that we have all the information yet to, to do that, to make an informed decision. Now, let's go to an audience quest question. How do we talk about free speech during this time uh, many faculty who are relying on the policies they place in their online classrooms, but free speech can be a hard space to navigate. Can you provide any tips? So I think, um, uh, go ahead, go, go ahead, Dr. Davis, no, Dr. Davis, go ahead. <laughs> 
Um, so some of my work has sort of started to broach that particular topic. Um, for me, the thing about free speech is that I think the, the legal framework is always limiting, right? And one of the things that we know from critical race theory work that emerged out of critical legal studies is that the law in and of itself is not neutral, right? It's not a tool to which we all have access. And so when we go to the conversation about free speech and the First Amendment, for me, when I think about the nature of post-secondary institutions as social institutions, we have to be considering the social impact of the things that we're allowing to take place and happen. And a lot of the conversation about hate speech um, and discourse in that regard is not thinking about the social impact. Is saying, well, because you have a quote unquote right to say the things you need to say, you also have the right to be free from consequence, right? Or free from any level of regulation that otherwise would deeply impact and affect the climate on our campus. And we see many speakers, both who are currently on campus, and this is sort of one of the things about the Zoom bombing for me, is that we always think it's some sort of outside threat. But to me, for someone to get a you know a listing of the class, to get the ID number to come into the Zoom, tells me that there are more white supremacists that have access on campus than there are those people who are coming off campus, right? And so I think we have to have a conversation about the social impact or the social detriment of you know, operating in this sort of laissez-faire approach to the, the First Amendment and free speech that moves us away from thinking about it just as a legal concept to really think about the social impact that ends up happening uh, when we allow certain things to persist under the guise of you know, freedom of speech. Anyone else want to type that one? No, I think, I think it's really important to begin to interrogate our own pedagogy approaches, like as faculty, um, you know, a lot of us, for many of us, we're subject matter experts in our field, but um, in our training and apprenticeship, um, in our doctoral studies, most of us were not trained um, to teach. And so we really need to begin to uh, focus on what does it mean in terms of our pedagogical approaches? Um, you know, coming from my own personal approaches, um, I, be, I really do um, research and read um, from pedagogical experts. Um, but that are coming from social justice uh, perspectives, like, um, you know, and we're, we're going to give you some resources, but, you know, Paulo Freire, Pedagogy of the Press, um, Bettina Love, you know, um, Bell Hooks, Pedagogies of Love. Um, and so it's really began to shape the way that I teach. And so when we have these conversations about uh, free speech, and if forms of hate speech do come out in your classroom, um, my take on that is that you, yeah, you, you have, it is our constitutional right for free speech, but that doesn't um, take away from having um, critical thought and critical consciousness in why do you believe and where, where does that come from? Or, you know, um, so you can say it, but if you're going to say this stuff in my classroom, you better also come with, you know, some, you know, some reasoning and justification for why that is the case of your discourse and why you believe that. I, I tend, in other words, I tend to take these opportunities to still be teachable moments uh, for my students, as well as particularly for the student who uh, wants to say something like that. Um, I don't, you know, I can't not let that happen. Again, free speech is there, but how do we change those into teachable moments for all of us to learn from? Yeah, no, very good. Next question is, how do you persuade senior administrators who think that diversity, equity, and inclusion is a distraction from focusing on the COVID-19 crisis that is really important, especially at this time. We touched on a little bit, but are there any specific um, suggestions you might have for this? Person? I mean, I don't think, you know, persuade is kind of the word I think that, that um, makes me shift around like, you know, I, the idea of, of having to persuade um, when you're in a higher education institution bothers me because um, we were all created on the foundation of, of higher education being a public good. Um, when you start to begin to uh, ignore, you know, issues of uh, equity, diversity, um, now I have to question um, who you are, right? And again, there's no problem with an institution saying that, um, yeah, guess what, you know, all of our students come from affluent uh, white backgrounds, you know, but then don't tell me that you're an institution of, for equity and diversity, like that, that's not your identity. Um, you are who you are. And so, you know, the idea that we have to persuade administration um, is bothersome. And again, it goes with the identity of the institution and organization of who you are. Anyone else wanna jump in on that one? I was just gonna agree that this is a good place for allyship to come in and really be like, I try to take on, like I'm always asking at the end of every conversation, what are the systems that are playing into this decision? 
where are the inequities, like taking on that for myself and just making, I'm the person in the room who's constantly bringing it up every time. And so um, I think this is a good time for white faculty to really step up and provide some allyship when you're in the room. Yeah. Here's a question. What are some examples of institutional policies and practices that could be adapted well during these times, particularly, particularly to avoid marginalization and discrimination? Dr. Davis? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think one of the things that we're seeing sort of uh, initially um, are things around admissions, right? And so we've seen a lot of institutions say we're no longer going to, you know, um, require the SAT or the ACT as a precondition for, you know, uh, admissions to our institution. And while that seems like, oh, that's great, you know, it's appropriate for this particular time, it also raises this broader question of, you know, why those things are weighed so heavily in admissions processes anyway, given what we know about the not only cultural bias, but the sort of disproportionate impact of the SAT and ACT on students of color, right? And so we have to answer a deeper question of why we're so committed and invested in a thing that actually is helping stratify us further and producing greater inequities. Um, we also have to think about, you know, the various affirmative action rollbacks, especially in this particular time, and the extent to which those have had deep effects on who's able to access, you know, our considered quote unquote elite institutions. And so I think around admissions, these are things that we need to think about of the deeper impacts of what COVID-19 has done. Um, and then what limitations, again, it pl places on the things that we say that we used to value that perhaps aren't as important as they used to be. Um, and I think that's a critical question that admissions officers um, and other senior academic officers are really going to need to uh, assess as we move forward, especially when we're thinking about the dip in enrollments possibly that may be the result of folks not wanting to pay, you know, top dollar for, you know, what it will otherwise end up being an online education, those who don't have resources to return to campus um, after this has happened. When we think about the, you know, expected family uh, commitment towards people's, uh, you know, education that for many folks with the 16 million folks who have filed for unemployment, EFCs of zero are going to go, you know, kind of through the roof, right? So then what are the financial packages that are appropriate? Will we see a less of a ballooning of tuition and cost sharing amongst students? So I think admissions and financial aid are probably the two areas um, that we've seen, you know, the most sort of head on direction for this, but we have to have an honest conversation about why we continue to do the things as usual when we could actually radically reimagine a different university. And reimagine, I like that. Anyone else want to? Chime in on that? Yeah, I think that's also um, plays way in terms of policy, right? So um, thinking of those strategies of, of what can we do, <laughs> this is a great time to think about and reimagine um, accountability measures that higher education has always had to deal with because a lot of these mm -hmm. um, abrupt shifts and changes um, throughout the course um, have really related to funding issues. Um, so really thinking and starting to address what success means um, in your particular institution and you know I want to give you know I want to think about this in broader beyond um, institutions that are uh, research intensive institutions um, I'm talking about uh, community colleges I'm talking about regional serving institutions I'm talking about um, those institutions that are teaching intensive um, so really thinking about what success means um, and how you're creating success because it's also going to involve discussions with policymakers about how your students are and are not successful, as well as accrediting agencies, too. Um, this is going to be that time to reimagine um, how you're serving and what you're doing and, and the accountability um, that you should be receiving. Yeah. Uh, maybe the final one last question. Um, this one says, thinking about how we move forward. This is the reentry question. Uh, not with best practices, but with next practices, as this new normal will require us to do our work differently. What are some specific recommendations you would have for faculty and staff to take, especially when students begin returning back to our campuses? Dr. Paris? So I immediately was thinking that this will not be over for everybody when they come back. This is going to be something that's long lasting. And I think we have to give that space, like we've already mentioned, for assessing where they are, what their needs are, what their capacity is. I don't think this is going to be over in the fall for so many of our students. And so how can we sort of deconstruct the systems that we're working in to make it more equitable, make it easier, reduce that, you know, that demand and that capacity to try to make it a safe space for them? And I think some people will think, well, like I'm already doing that, but doing it intentionally is a different thing. And doing it intentional in light of you may not always be aware of exactly where your students are when they come into the room. And so 
for me, coming back is going to be a lot of what is this new normal, talking to the students, getting their reactions, and adjusting accordingly, and making sure that I'm providing as many opportunities as we can to really have that conversation and keep it going, and that it's not one of those, oh, we're back, we're not going to talk about this anymore, it's over, right? Yeah, Dr. Sensible. No, I think, um, you know, and I also think about uh, doing doing the intentionality and, and having these discussions, even in large classroom settings, right? Like of the 300 um, introductory courses, you know, lecture halls. Um, it's going to, you know, to, to, and I really like Dr. Davis's word of reimagining, right? Um, you know, uh, ASH, the Associate University of Higher Education, um, annual conference uh, was focused on this idea of reimagining higher education. And so um, I think that word has stuck with me in this COVID era, but a reimagining how to do that kind of intentionality in ways that we've never um, had to do before. Um, I, you know, I don't know if, if things can go back the same, um, like, a, a, you know, a 300 person uh, classroom like that. Um, we, you know, we're going to have to think of new ways to um, address these things and the strategies. It's it's difficult to have them right off the gate because, like we've we've said throughout this whole uh, webcast, that um, we're still shifting and changing um, every day uh, the way that higher education. So it's really hard to begin to create a plan um, when nothing is stable right now. Um, but I think sitting in that and um, leaning into that uncomfortableness of the instability, um, I do believe that we can come up with, with uh, certain ways and strategies to reimagine it. But as far as you know, what that will look like specifically at each institution, I'm not quite sure. Um, and, and I'm you know, focusing on just my own classroom to see what I can do um, in the power structures that I have with my own students. Well said, Dr. Davis. Uh, I think, yeah, all great points. Um, I think, you know, two main things are sticking out to me, um, and in particular thinking about Dr. Paris's work, um, the extent to which faculty are ill prepared to deal with sort of the socio emotional aspects of what their students are going through and dealing with, you know, someone who's, you know, has a student affairs background and works in um, higher ed as a field of study. These are things for which I was prepared and trained, um, as well as being, you know, an organizer, but a lot of folks don't have that skill, right. And so I think even, you know, just base level, when we think about beyond um, or actually in addition to addressing issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, what about socio-emotional health and how do we create space for students to have, you know, less of perhaps, a, you know, a stressor when it comes to the expectations of what their assignments will even look like or the extent to which they need to be, you know, turned in in a timely fashion, given that, you know, for many of our institutions that are no longer, you know, regional, but actually national in scope, you know, if I've got a student who's from New Orleans that comes to USC and I know what New Orleans is going through, I have to expect that that student probably has some things still going on at home that I need to be, you know, sort of accounting for and answerable to. Um, and so I think that's gonna be really important of how we think about the socio-emotional environments that we construct in our classrooms. I think in addition to that, we have to be open to, um, you know, a new approach to assessment, right? And, and really thinking about assessment in a way that isn't about rank ordering students, you know, in terms of GPA, but really assessing, you know, our effectiveness as instructors of whether we are allowing students space to learn what they need to, and we can measure those according to our learning objectives. And that's what we're seeing a bit when we have shifted for some institutions to a pass fail structure right, just for the semester, but we have to extend even further beyond that. And I know that there are broader implications that we have to consider, you know, with certain jobs and how they rank folks um, for admissions into graduate school and things of that nature. But again, what is really important in this moment, and for me, it's people. And so when we talk about possibly reopening institutions, when we talk about moving forward, we have to constantly place people, again, over profit, over productivity, over prestige, and make sure that the survival of people is more important than the survival of our institution. Well said, and that's certainly a, a great place to end this conversation. Certainly want to thank all of you for engaging in conversation. I learned a lot, quite frankly, and I'm sure all of you did as well. So thank you, and I'll turn it over to Wendy. Great, thank you, thank you so much. Um, and we do hope you join us for our next uh, webcast. Here's the information there, it's next Wednesday. Um, and again, thank you so much for joining today. It was a great discussion, and we hope to see you on a future webcast. Once the Zoom room closes, you will see a survey pop up. So please um, complete that for us. We'd love to get your feedback on this webcast and ideas for future webcasts. So again, thank you so much for joining and we hope to see you next time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.